We'll just do a quick overview of the Alaska Tribal Resilience Learning Network. Um, this is Uh, our offices are in Trath Vieta, which is in Fairbanks, or otherwise known as Indian Potato Ridge, and Denina Athlena. And not listed here is also Thinke Ani. We have two scientists down in um, Juneau, and myself as a tribal liaison. Um, we really are here um, to provide technical assistance uh, for tribes and connect uh, you know, tribes with um, climate resources and climate information. Uh, along with our monthly information sessions, uh, we also are available for one-on-one -on -one check-ins. Uh, we have an e-bulletin where we disperse a lot of you know, upcoming events and uh, grant information as well. So if you aren't a part of it and would like to know more, that's a really good way to get involved. Uh, today, uh, as I mentioned briefly, we will um, be hearing more about this grant, the BIA Tribal Climate Resiliency Grant. Um, we are very excited to uh, have Jennifer Robinette online, and she can give us a little bit more about her position and her involvement with this. And then we'll, we'll go on to success stories. Uh, um, we have guests from the Central Council of Clinkin Haida and the Native Village of Diomede who have received this uh, award before and we'll be sharing a little bit more with their of their experience um, and how they're able to, you know, um, design and implement their projects. And with that, I am going to pass it off to Jennifer. Jennifer, if you want to introduce yourself and any other information about the like BIA TRC grant. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jennifer Robinette. I live and work here in Anchor Point at my home. I work for BIA Tribal Climate Resilience. And um, I'm gonna, I might look like I'm looking off into the corner. I'm just gonna move my screen, I think. Maybe it won't let me, okay, there we go. Um, just so that I can um, make sure that when I'm sharing information, I can give you the right numbers. Um, so in one month, uh, we have our annual awards do and so if you if you're not familiar with it already it's a annual awards program to support tribes with their um with future and current climate change impacts and um so we have two categories and those are planning and implementation the planning projects are a minimum i mean a maximum of $250,000 the implementation category um, tribes can apply for up to four million. And then we have uh, some set asides, set asides for first time applicants, and those would be planning projects as well. And so th that's two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars maximum. And then um, habitat restoration and ad adaptation and a set aside for relocation, manage retreat or protect in place coordinator. And that is to help uh, tribes grow capacity so that if you need a person on staff working on this, these issues, that would help the tribe do that. Um, the maximum is 150 per year for up to three years. So, um, with that, I will I will open it up to questions. Um, and I can put the the link in the chat so that you can get to the portal. Um, it will be in the blue box mid page on this website. Um, the solicitation information is also a link 
within this website. Oh, I'm having a hard time getting everything I need. Okay. And I can even show my screen really quick if if you'd like to see the website and where to find the information that I'm talking about. Okay, um, so here's our website and if you just scroll down, this is the blue box I was referring to. There's the, the solicitation. And so it has all of what you'll need to put into your application. Here is our um, application portal. And you I don't just see set your up... screen being shared. Oh. Um... Oh. I'm sorry about that. Do you see it now? <laughs> okay, so yeah, um, the the website that I shared in the chat is um, this one. You scroll down. Here's the blue box. Um, here's the button for the solicitation. It has all the information you'll need to turn in an application. And here's our awards portal. And um, And uh, through this website, you'll be able to find my contact information, but I will also um, I will also put that in the chat. Oh, did it not share still? Okay, okay. All right. Well, thank you, Jennifer. We'll actually be taking questions at the end to give the presenters a little bit more time. Um, in that case, Kenneth, if you want to start sharing your screen, we'll pass it, we'll hand the mic over to the Central Council of Clinka and Haida to share about their BIA TCR grant. Hi, how does that, does that look okay? Mm -hmm. Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Kenneth Weitzel. I'm a natural resource specialist with Klinket and Haida. I am a Klinket Chok Tequiri Dakuste from Huna Kawu, a tribal member. And uh, I am here with Amy. Amy, please. Yeah, I'm Amy Erfling. I'm the Klinket and Haida Regional Greenhouse Coordinator. And I just started in March of 20 of this year. Thank you, Amy. Uh, we will be going very fast through a quick history run up of how we started and how we got to where we are today. Uh, then Amy's going to tell us about where we are today, and then we'll talk about where we hope to go in the future. And uh, this is going to be a lot of information, and it's going to be really fast. So uh, buckle up. Here we go. Uh, before 2019, back in 2017, our environmental coordinator, who is now an environmental manager, initiated the first request for the TCRP program to create that capacity. And that's how in 2017, my job position was created, was from that first step, uh, reaching out to the program to create the capacity. Uh, in 2017, I was hired for the second phase, which was a, a, another program to create the climate change adaptation plan and a template. I think at Haida is a regional uh, tribe, so we have up to 16 other federally recognized village tribes within our region. And we're like an umbrella supporting all the other tribes. So on top of a climate change adaptation plan for Southeast Alaska, which had not been created, we also created a template for those other tribes. So they can also uh, get that climate change adaptation plan in for their tribe. And if you don't have somebody that can do that, 
getting somebody that can do that is step one with this program. But if you do have somebody that can do that, step two would be implementing a climate change adaptation plan. And you could use, we created the template that I think Kodiak and uh, Andy Wall, I think I saw her name pop up. Uh, that's an example of one of the tribes outside of Southeast that have uh, used this template. And the template's gone all the way to uh, Great Britain, Denmark, Norway, and of course, British Columbia, uh, places that are analogs to Southeast Alaska. Uh, in 2019, I, I spent two solid years writing that climate change adaptation plan, diving in, becoming subject matter experts on everything I was writing. Two years later, the Executive Council for Clinkett and Haida approved the climate change adaptation plan. And that's when we started our third iteration of the TCRP program, which was we were now going to create a social economic impact assessment of climate change in Southeast Alaska. Then COVID hit and that changed everything. We flexed and so did BIA uh, Tribal Climate Resilience Program. Because COVID hit, we were hoping to have a lot of community input for the social economic impact assessment. Because of COVID, we weren't allowed to interact with the community. So organically, something good happened out of this. The Executive Council created a climate change committee that is part of the Executive Council. So instead of uh, reaching out to the community, we were able to get steering directions from this climate change executive council that used the information from the climate change adaptation plan that I wrote earlier. And we created the climate change action plan, the social economic impact assessment changes in the climate change action plan. That climate change action plan was written during COVID, was written during the lockdowns. Uh, I have an 11 year Navy uh, history past. I was also also the situational awareness officer for the Tribal Emergency Operations Center dealing with COVID. So with everything that was going on with my particular plug in to the current situation, the Climate Change Action Plan really came out as uh, a warning of potential pitfalls of communities in Alaska that have to deal with climate change, uh, pandemics, and any other type of situation. And what this climate change action plan created was that we need to focus on food security and food sovereignty, because as everyone here in Alaska knows, we're, we're the last mile, unless you live in Anchorage, you your destination is the last mile. So we're on those places where uh, supply chain was really affected. And uh, that's what came out of the Climate Change Action Plan. The Executive Council approved that. And that's when we started our third iteration into the uh, TCRP program with creating a greenhouse and a greenhouse program a community greenhouse coordinator program that would expand on the greenhouse that we're learning from here that we had uh, in 2021 that we got with uh, additional other funding agencies and uh, with the lessons learned that we got from our greenhouse that we built here, we put in another a TCRP program for the creation of a regional community greenhouse program that will expand on the lessons learned that we have from all of these programs cascading into other programs. And uh, right now we're at the spot where we have our greenhouse, which is Tehit, that's the Klinkit name. And uh, we have our regional community greenhouse coordinator, which is Amy. 
she has taken over this program for the local greenhouse and the coordination of expanding greenhouses in Southeast Alaska. And let me see what that, okay. Here is uh, our first greenhouse. This was uh, BIA funding and NAF awards. Uh, and we've had some really good lessons learned with this program. <laughs> Uh, a lot of the, the majority of things you learn in life are what not to do. And we learned a lot of that. So, uh, Amy, if you would like to take yeah, over and I'll jump in whenever, okay. yeah. whenever you ask, go for it. Thanks, and just Kenneth. Say next. <laughs> Kenneth has the background of all this since I just started in 20, uh, the, in March. Um, I've been up here for the past 13 years in Southeast Alaska as a grower, um, and just joined here in March as a coordinator, um, so this was, I took over Tehit in, um, it, when I got here in March, it, it is a 42 foot diameter dome from growing spaces. And there's only about 350 square feet of growing beds, but we've done a lot with that. Um, it is climate control, has, it's a soil system. It has heat pumps, intake exhaust fans. There's some piping to heat the soil and the perimeter beds. Um, we don't have any supplemental lighting, so we haven't done winter growing yet. And there's also no dehumidifier, so that's been a bit of an issue with the humidity in Southeast Alaska. And it was really meant to be an educational space. And the produce that we are growing right now is donated to the Elders Lunch Program here in Juneau. Next slide. So these are some pictures of what uh, Tehich looks like now. Um, well, this I guess was in this was in June. Um, this is from like May and June. Um, we're growing lots of different crops in there. You can see the heat pumps and the um, intake fans in this picture. And there's some spinach and um, zucchini, some flowers, some marigolds that are good for pest um, control and green onions, tomatoes, basil, lots of good stuff. Go to the next one. And then this is, is showing some more of Tehit. And then the um, we've been growing a lot of tomatoes, which have been great. Um, radishes early season, and then cucumbers, carrots, um, zucchini. Go to the next slide. And then most recently, we've finally been getting our peppers to uh, ripen and that's been wonderful and so a lot of the crops you can't really grow outdoors in southeast alaska we've been able to grow in in this wonderful garden house go to the next screen and we've had a great harvest so this is what we've harvested this is um would have been from april there was a bit of a harvest through august this is what our harvest has been so i did decide to do um mainly warm season crops so a lot of tomatoes zucchini cucumber pepper um, but i also wanted to try some of the cool season crops to just see what would do well in there especially coming into winter and cooler seasons we'll try to keep that temperature down a little bit lower um, because of energy costs so you can just see we've we've harvested a lot so far and then the next slide. And so that leads us into then the Regional Community Greenhouse Program. Um, this is specifically for food security and food sovereignty is the goal. It was a BIA um, Tribal Climate Resilience Grant and it was it's category 10 implementation project. And so specifically in the grant proposal that Kenneth wrote um, was to install greenhouses in three different communities in Southeast Alaska. And Tehit is the pilot project for the program. And it was written to install similar domes, um, but we do have the flexibility, luckily within this grant, which is great to um, change the greenhouse to really fit what the community needs are. Um, and I was hired on in March of 2023, and we're looking at administering this grant as a subrecipient award for the different communities. So they also have some flexibility in how they want to use that funding for their commun specific community needs. And so right now we're really in the process still of um, drafting these subcipient agreements with the different tribes. And we haven't quite gotten anything um, totally finalized yet, but we're getting close. Um, and so with that, you know, you see a lot of, just in general with a greenhouse, 
greenhouses in Southeast Alaska. Um, some of the challenges you can see, there's quite a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities. The biggest challenges I would say is the energy cost. You know, in Juneau, we have a pretty low energy cost compared to electrical energy costs compared to some of these other communities. And so we've noticed that that has been a big concern of the other communities in terms of the all the equipment that goes into a greenhouse. Um, and there's really a lot, a lot of lack of research and data for Southeast Alaska in general, for not just greenhouses, but for agriculture. Um, some of the huge opportunities, though, is really four seasons of growing and being able to have the fresh produce in the winter will be wonderful. Um, and then and food security is something that is just the number one opportunity, I would say. And so some of the funding challenges, I mean, just working in this field of really the self-sustainability of greenhouse program, it's it's just in agriculture in general, um, a lot of the safe, the sustainability of operating a greenhouse for um, the energy costs for the year round growing, I see as being um, quite a challenge and really needing that additional funding to help with that. And then maintaining employment. I've worked at a few other greenhouses in Southeast Alaska, and a lot of times really maintaining that employment is critical from year to year. And, you know, the same people really, because it takes a while to understand your system and to really get it to operate well. And so um, that's also, I think, can be a funding challenge. And then um, as Kenneth and I were discussing, really creating these programs to actually fit within the guidelines of the funding um, can also be a challenge. And then I would just say with regional programs in general, what I'm definitely noticing is that, you know, every community is unique. And we actually didn't do community assessments um, as Kenneth was talking with COVID and um, some of those difficulties. And so really assessing community needs, I think is very important with regional programs. And then just having that flexibility with the funding sources um, is really important for some of these regional programs. And some of our future plans, I mean, I'd love to see all of these get done, um, but we definitely want to look at doing community assessments for Southeast Alaska and um, looking at just whatever regional funding we can do for agriculture, because, um, you know, just having that food security and food sovereignty is really important. Um, specifically for Tehit, we're installing more indoor beds, as I was saying, that the square footage right now that we're growing in is only about a quarter of the square footage. And so we're installing more beds indoors. And then we're doing some outdoor raised beds to grow some of the crops that you can't really do very well in the in the greenhouse. Um, some of the more cool season crops like potatoes and garlic, um, some of the cabbages, cauliflower, broccoli. And then we're also doing a native plant garden. <clears throat> we would love to do a larger greenhouse for Juno. And this was kind of the beginning to see how it goes and um, to be able to grow more food year round up here. And um, we're also looking at potentially some native plant propagation for restoration projects um, that we could do in Southeast Alaska. And really it's all about food security and sovereignty to have more resilient communities in our region. I think that's all we got. <laughs> I told you that was quick and sweet and it, there's <laughs> going to be a lot of information. So uh, that's where we are today and that's how we got here. Uh, the program is set out to where you can start from the very beginning with nothing. You just need to have somebody, a dedicated person to say, I want to apply for this. That's the first step, apply. And with that, I think uh we can open up for questions or we can pass off to diamede whatever you see fit um, it's cool to see will just come into fruition in all the like even literal meanings a hundred over a hundred pounds of uh, tomatoes that's so neat um we will be taking questions uh at the end um and we're gonna pass it off to OPEC. I am going to share my screen um, for her. Are you ready, OPEC? Okay. Yep, I'm getting all ready. Perfect. 
Are you? I I can't. Can you? Can you share this? Yeah. Okay. So I know it's off. And then, if you're controlling the pages, should I just tell you when to turn? Yes, absolutely. That. Can you hear me? You make it louder from this thing. All the way to the we top. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. I hope everybody can hear me, and I also hope that we don't get disconnected. <laughs> um, but what we'll see how it, how this will work for us. Are we ready? Yes, ready when you are. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Opeka Kinga. I'm with the Native Village of Dainid. Um, I've been with the with the tribe since um January 2013. I I started as an environmental coordinator under the EPA IGAP program. And um, I continue to work that program today. Um, so being under the IGAP program, it allowed me to seek other resources out there because this program has been focusing on climate change uh, since 2015. And then, um, you know, with that and, and um, knowing the importance of um, focusing on climate change for our community, um, that was a big must because we need to monitor those changes so we, that we can engage the community to be involved, you know, so that everybody is safe. So um, thank you, BIA and all the others who helped get this Zoom conference rolling. It is really important um, to learn that other communities and other communities are conducting to educate and engage their own community community members or our own community members on the modern changing the modern changing climate which is causing our oceans to be warmer and that the chemistry of the ocean has changed as these changes occur it has forced us to become engaged with our disengaged with our traditional inupiaq subsistence food lifestyle, which is why we are, we have this project going today. Um, next, next page. So we hear about climate change impacts all over the world. We are seeing extreme fall, tidal and winter storms. We're seeing shorter seasons of winter ice and late freeze up. Um, we, we're seeing changes in the ice condition where in the past it used to be old ice or multi-year ice where the ice was would uh, be as thick as maybe even over five feet. Um, you know, maybe over five feet in thickness. Whereas now, since um, we're declining in the, uh, with the old ice, I mean, losing the old ice and then now we have the, uh, new ice, not even a year old ice. This is this new ice is not. It's not the the normal ice condition Dimeet is used to because you know in the winter season we use we use this ice to do our hunting, uh, for seals and then also for fishing for sculpin and then our our best favorite is the um catching the blue king crab which is a traditional harvest for Dimeet. And you'll see in this uh, in our in this presentation um, methods we use to catch the crab. Um, it was in in um, I believe it was late 2019 or early 2020. I cannot remember correct the correct year, but um, I hopped in to, on a teleconference with Norton Sound Health Corporation, and and there was Ocean and Earth Environmental. That's uh, Chris Whitehead. And the topic then that was being shared with the regional members in our uh, uh, in the Nome area, the the topic was on harmful algal bloom, and that caught my attention because I was, um, I, I was I I was aware of what harmful algal bloom was, um, so um i knew how how serious that would be because um harmful algal bloom is is uh oh 
harmful algal bloom is um it's a serious it's a serious event that occurs in our ocean and this places a lot of change um in our Inupiaq traditional lifestyle when it comes to subsistence food. Next page, please. So you'll see um, the, the aim for this project with the BIA grant is to collect uh, key informational data from our traditional food harvest of blue king crab and to identify changes and impacts that will be used to establish adaptation and mitigation strategies for traditional harvests. Um, it's really important us, for us to do so because um, with the changing chemistry of the ocean, we, we, are, we don't know what is safe to eat or, or if it isn't safe to eat. So we need to, um, it's important for us to monitor the ocean um, doing science. So in order to do so, there, there's, uh, in order to collect baseline da data, um, uh, you, you need the proper training. So this did, it didn't happen with this BIA grant this year, but then the prior year um, with World Wildlife Fund, um, I was able to, um, to establish a a program where I was going to first invite people to come in to train me to use proper, use the proper skills and science equipment that was needed to conduct the um, monitoring and to collect baseline data. Next page, please. So, oops, no, go back. I'm sorry. Why are your pages? Okay, here we go. Yep, you're on the right page. So, collecting biological data to track changing to track changing ocean conditions. Um, um, collecting baseline data using a phytoplankton net tow was the first thing that I, I done in this, um, with this project. And so it had helped me to get an idea of, you know, what phytoplankton is you know, and um, the different types of phytoplankton. There's common phytoplankton that are not harmful. And then there's also phytoplankton that are um, harmful and are toxic. So uh, one of the equipment I use is a net tow. Another equipment I use um, to check the water chemistry or water quality for uh, saxitoxins, domoic acid and pH. Um, I'm lost. <laughs> um, water quality testing. Okay, see, I'm I'm so lost. Mm. I have okay. a question about your harmful oh, algal blooms. Do you uh, wait? No, no, no. Can you can you hold ahead. off a I'm second? Because I'm trying to I I'm trying to gather what I was going to say. So. In order to collect baseline biological baseline data for phytoplankton, you, we need the netto to collect uh, water quality for saxitoxin, domoic acid, and to check the pH of the ocean condition. You will we use um, different um, equipment to do so, and I don't I didn't take a I didn't take a photo shot of those. Sorry about that. Um, I've also done CTD casts. Uh, a CTD is equipment that is used to collect conductivity, temperature, and depth. Um, we'll see that again in these in the photos. Um, yeah, I mean in this PowerPoint. The next uh, one we do collect is whole water samples for EcoHab. But my my EcoHab is a big place. EcoHab is all. I mean, there's different. It's a program throughout all the. U.S. is that correct? Yep. So the water samples that I do collect are are for AC Hab, and that's sent to a. It's under Eco Hab. I don't want to confuse you, but it's sent to an AC Hab program where they go and um they can look at the water samples, the phytoplankton under my water sample collection, and then another one I've conducted was um um 
collecting the viscous from the blue king crab to check for um, biotoxin or demoic acid. So if you turn the next, go down to the next slide, you will see this is the phytoplankton net, net toe. Um, this net toe is, um, it's dropped down between three and five meters down in, under the ice. And you'll see uh, on this picture, this is a crab hole, which I use to drop my hand line to retrieve blue king crab. Um, so I drop this net toe three to five meters down. And then I, you see the little bottle at the bottom. Uh, that one fills up with water all the way to the rim. And I cover that and, and bring it back to the office where it's later viewed under the eye microscope because you cannot see phytoplankton under, I mean, with an unaided eye, you, you need that microscope to see it. So usually when I'm looking at phytoplankton under the microscope on here in Diamede, I'm looking for identification of phytoplankton. Um, uh, next page, please. Like I said, um, uh, there, there are phytoplankton all over the world in all the parts of the ocean water, ocean water and freshwater too, but we're focusing on ocean water. So phytoplankton is everywhere in the ocean and blooms are caused by many phytoplankton. And what this program is doing is focusing on the three species of harmful algal bloom, which is uh, species of harmful, harmful algal bloom that is Alexandrium. Alexandrium is a saxitoxin, and uh, th this causes uh, um, living organisms to become, you know, sick and, you know, even it becomes fatal w with the, the, the organism. So the symptoms, if you were to get it, it with saxitoxins are loss of motor skill. Um, the next one is dinophyces. Dinophyces, um, it's an okadaic acid, and the symptoms are diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. I did find dinophyces uh, a lot of times since I started looking under the microscope. So that was from 2020, 20, yeah, since 2020. Um, so dinophyces is always seen in our, our waters. Another one is um, pseudonychia. Pseudonychia is uh, responsible for the toxin of demoic acid. And the, sh the uh, symptoms are short-term memory loss. So these three things are, are what I, I take note of when I'm looking under the microscope. Um, so I can say, yep, I did, I did see all three target species of um, harmful algal bloom. So they are present in our water. <clears throat> um, um, in order for, uh, or in order for, uh, a, a harmful algal bloom to occur and when they do occur, that's because they're the nutrients in water are the nutrients in the ocean water are so rich. They they all come together and join, you know, and they're they they need the those nutrients to um, survive and reproduce. Next page, you see these are the these. You're on the wrong page. Nope. I already did, yeah. Nope. You're going up. You're. Uh, next page. Yep. So these ones are blue king crab. Um, these are our traditional foods. We we've been catching them for hundreds of years. I want to say, maybe, <laughs> um, with the uh, with our traditional method of catching them is with the hand line. If you look at the picture on the right, this is um, a hand line uh, with a thirty pound line and then a sinker attached at the bottom. It's dropped all the way. The sinker is about four ounces and has a um, fish bait attached to it. And it's dropped all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. 
And the crab, they crawl to the bait, they smell it, they crab to the bait, they feed. So they're pinching on it. And as they're pinching, we know the crab is there. We, we tug on the line. And and then when there's a crab, we, we gracefully pull it up to the surface and uh, pull the crab out with their hand. Um, these crab right here that I'm collecting uh, they are from um, other locals here. And then uh, I, I go and visit these um, the crabber and ask if I can take samples, uh, take measurements of their crabs, which is they, they always allow me to do it. Um, but then the, they, <laughs> they will not allow me to take the, the viscous from their crab that's uh, the stomach of the crab. This is where we're, we're testing for, collecting samples to test for biotoxin, you know, to check for domoic acid. But nobody wants to give that part up. I did, I was, however, able to collect uh, 28 biotoxin samples in 2020, 2022. And uh, these samples were sent down to NOAA down in South Carolina to be tested. So, uh, and most of those samples were collected by me. I, I feel like I'm missing a page. Okay, um, go to the next page, please. Nope. Um, one more. Nope, you're going down. Yep, right there. Okay, so this is with focusing on the blue king crab. Um, so I've established three plots in 2022. Um, and these are just um, areas on the ice where people or groups of people are crabbing. So I, I established one more on the south side of our island. And then I established one about 20 feet away from that plot. And that's plot B. And then another one further closer to the village, plot C. So I had three plots where I would collect um, baseline data from the blue king crab. I'm measuring the crab. I'm weighing the crab. Um, and I'm also taking the viscous um, of the crab to check for biotoxin. So when you when we take the uh, when we take the go on the next page, when we take the um, the crab tissue from the uh, blue king crab, you see on the second photo there. So th all this yellow stuff is the crab tissue. And this is this is the stomach of the crab. What I do is I scrape that out and I put it into a into a cup, and um, then I take a a blender and I blend it up so all the tissue is you know it's it's the the tissue it all turns into a, like a smoothie, and then I pour it in into a little vial. This a uh, this is a fifty m uh, ml vial, so. I, I pour that and I want to leave some space at the top, you know, so does it doesn't the, the vial doesn't um, explode when it freezes because they the the tissue sample will expand. Um, so I pour in a vial and then I um, I log it. I log it onto a sheet of paper. So, you know, I'm, I'm ensuring that all of these are documented. And then as soon as I collect enough, I, I sh pack, properly package them out. They have to be shipped out um, frozen. That means I have to have the supplies, like, um, what do you call that? Fro that ice, dry ice. Um, it's really hard to get dry ice um, in, if any of you are doing um, monitoring. You know, I mean, if you're sending out uh, samples that have to be frozen, it's hard to get dry ice here on Dimeet. So I have to lean on my the, the person I work with uh, that's Chris Whitehead with Ocean and Earth Environmental and he can collect get that for me and package it and ship it to me. Um, so with those samples uh, uh, collecting the 
um, biotoxin from the crab samples, they are able to um, get a reading on uh, on levels of domoic acid. You'll see that later on. Mm. So with the biotoxin, we're testing for saxitoxins and domoic acid. So next page, the, um, okay, I wrote this down. This is where I'm gonna need. Okay. So when car, when uh, carbon dioxide dissolves into the seawater, the, the water and carbon dioxide combine and it forms carbonic acid, carbo carbonic acid that, and, and when that is weak, when it's a weak acid, it breaks into hydrogen, hydrogen ions and biocarbonate ions. And then as this, as the, um, um, oceans pH at, at, uh, pH level increases the carbon car, carbonate ions bond with excess hydrogen and that results in uh, fewer uh, carbonate ions ions to calify organisms to build shells so you can see in this picture um, um, with excess hydrogen, it, it makes it harder for crab to calify. So, you know, these crab, I, I believe, I think it's like every seven years they'll shed their sh shell. And then, you know, it's their, when they do that, they, they have a new shell that's um, really soft when they shed their old shell, um, really soft. And then, so they need the, they, they need, um, they need the, um, Carbon, carbonic acid and hydrogen ions to um, make a, um, or to calify their shell. You can see in this one, this crab, we saw many crab like this, this uh, in 2022 where there were abnormalities. And you can tell that um, that's probably because the ocean was acidic. Um, so this crab was harvested, taken home. I, I don't, uh, I uh, we didn't eat that little egg, but then you know the meat is still good to eat. We're not going to scare the people and say, "Here we are, look at this crab. You shouldn't eat it." Nope. Um, we this crab was taken aback and it was um, eaten. Uh, next page. Um, another one th that I've done was uh, CTD casting. You can see the little black, um, the little equipment there that is a CTD that collects conductivity, temperature, and depth. And uh, so this is an older CTD, which was um, given to me to uh, to be used by um, uh, what is it? A A A A O. What is that? AUS. Oh, I'm, I'm, I don't know the acronym. AOS. It's uh it's um Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub. Um and that's with Donna Hauser. She she was the one that sent me that equipment to use so I can deploy it and receive the readings. You can, the, the equipment goes all the way down. I believe this one went down maybe about uh 60 feet down to the bottom of the ocean, and then I agree I I pull the pull it back up. And then you see the little iPad there, it's connected. And it, it takes a reading and the picture on the right side is a reading, but that is not my reading. I, I didn't have time to put my uh, CTT cast readings on, on here. Um, and then the next one, the next picture, oh, uh, that's just, a, this is just a picture of uh, one of my, the people that worked with me uh, collecting the samples after a day of crabbing, we head back with all the samples and then I bring it back to the um, office and then I look under the microscope. I didn't need to stick that one in there. So on the next page is uh, 
um, collecting the phytoplankton samples you can see right here. So like I said, um, I identified all three target species of um, harmful algal bloom. Um, but so now we, we need to Um, inform the community. So if the if the level of saxitoxin in the shellfish was um, um, higher than um, 80, microgram, 80 micrograms, 80 or 80 micrograms, that's when we alert the you know community not to take the crab or the shellfish. Dye meat is not, I mean, long ago we used to eat uh, take the mussels from the beach, but, you know, people haven't been doing it. So, you know, I wouldn't encourage the community to eat the mussels from the beach that wash ashore. Um, and then, so if you can look at the, the max values of, of what was tested, it was uh, measured in the, of the 26 crab that I, I, I mean, crab tissue that I sent to Noah. Um, 30, uh, 33 micrograms saxitoxin was tested and then also uh, 60 nanograms of demoic acid. So these are all low, the, the, they're pretty low levels. They're all below the regular limit. And I believe the regular, I mean, the, the limit for um, saxitoxins, like I said, was 80 microgram, micrograms, if that makes sense. Next. Oh, yep. Okay. Um, and lastly, the, the funding we, we did have was World Wildlife Fund. That was 2021 to 2022. That one was a very successful one. Um, and that one was just a small one from 2021 to 2023 with the World Wildlife Fund. That was only $30,000 to get me started on a pilot project, you know, because this was when I was like, oh, yes, this was something I wanted to do. Um, you know, I was on the uh, research vessel Sekuliak in the whole month of June 2017. And then again, the whole month of June 2018. And I was able to work uh, alongside um, scientists who were doing research on, on different um, uh, ocean science. So I was able to, you know, go in and see the different types of um, science that they were doing with the ocean. And with that, it, I, coming back to Diamede and, and focusing under my IGAP program about uh, climate change and um, ocean science, I, it, it, I was, um, you know, I feel like I was very fortunate to bump into that day. Norton Sound was hosting a harmful algal bloom teleconference was where I was able to contact Chris and him and I were able to work together and, and keep this program going. Um, we applied for the BIA resilience grant in 2022, 2021 later and received it in 2022. And then we also extended it because um, you know, with uh, COVID and during COVID times. And then of course, with our changing ice conditions, it kind of, you know, pulled us back from doing a lot of the um, science research we wanted to do. So we have extended to 2024. Um, we also have EcoHab, um, which, which is where we kept, collect the ACHAB, the phytoplankton. I thought it was you. Uh, no. Funny, 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 funny. Okay, well. Mm. Can somebody mute their thing? Their whatever, yeah. their phone? Okay, so that's the current funding. The next step for us with this program now and this year, um, I want to, and it's not bulleted right here, but right now I am, I continue to collect phytoplankton on the open water. Um, this is new. Uh, the samples of phytoplankton I was collecting was um, on the ice uh, in the winter and spring season. And then now I started in the late summer um, to collect 
phytoplankton and then it's and and I'm collecting it now even though it's early fall and as long as the boat can take me out I'm, I'm going to continue to go out and collect phytoplankton and then once a week I'll collect um, OA samples for uh, Jenner Jacqueline Ramsey um, and this coming spring there's going to be more crab sampling and along with that crab sampling there's going to be all that other um, monitoring for um, harmful algal bloom. Another one I wanted to collect was auklets to check for sax saxitoxin because auklets, these are seabirds that are uh, another traditional food harvest for diamede. So usually we, we would collect them in the fall or late fall, we can collect the, the baby auklets. That, that are making their way to the ocean to feed off phytoplankton, then they fly back to their nesting sites, which is just, you know, in the holes of the, uh, around our island. Another one I want to collect is blue mussels. I already did collect about uh, a quart of them and sent them to, um, sent them along with a marine advisory program in Nome, and she is shipping them off to North South Carolina NOAA lab. And so now uh, this program, we, we're, I, we're looking for new funding to keep this um, project going with BIA. So, you know, so we can get more equipment, more equipment and do different, different um, science, ocean science measurements. Um, with that, I I'm I I believe um that's it. Oh wait, oh there is one that I didn't include, um in there. We, we are collecting samples for ocean acidification, um. But those are the slides. Those are the pictures I didn't in, include in there. And then with um, um. Yeah, so I'm collecting that, and those will be sent out. All the samples that I do send out to NOAA. Um, Alutic Pride and EcoHab, all the results are sent back to the, the tribe. Yep, that's it. Do you have any questions? We are running a, it is 12.02, so we understand that you have to hop off. Um, Kenneth, Amy, and Robert, you need to take some questions. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for our presenters? It looks like Jennifer has had to hop off. Go ahead, Jan. Hi, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know how we are on time, but I have a few questions for both uh, tribes. First of all, thank you for having this. And, you know, we all know that Alaska is unique with everybody's village different. I'm right in the middle of Diomede and Juno right there hooper bay and you know um these things that you guys brought up you know we thought about these in the past but you know with murbach that uh changed everything it pushed what we are dealing with to the murbach and the flooding erosion to number one but these are things that we thought of in the past the question i have first is for um the uh greenhouses are those um greenhouses but yeah, first of all, they look nice. Are they prefabricated or were, are they your own design? Um, the, the the one that we have installed right now, Tehit, is, is prefabricated. That one came from growing spaces in Colorado, the dome. And then the one right now, we're really the furthest right now is Skagway for our regional program. And we are looking at a different company um, called series greenhouses that are also prefabricated but it's more and Yakutat which is also in southeast has one of their greenhouses and it's more of that it's um the north side is solid and and insulated and then it just slopes so the north is flat and then it slopes down um to really just catch more of the sun from the southern so there's more insulation to keep it warmer hopefully in the winter 
And that's also prefabricated. We didn't do our own design on that. Yeah. Okay. All right. And the next question is, um, in the future, um, you know, we've, I mean, I've spoken with um, Kelly May. He, uh, they are doing a hydroponic farm in Fairbanks. Are, is that in the future planning for hydroponics? Because, you know, that could make so much uh, room with that space that you have, the dome, you know, it's looking at that floor space and all. Mm -hmm. You Just know that, that future yeah. planning. Potentially. So, I, I mean, I, I have worked with hydroponics before here in Southeast, and I think, you know, there are some definitely some benefits and trade-offs, though, for, um, you know, it's super highly productive system. But then you're also, I've worked in indoor and in greenhouses. So, like, indoor, you always have to have lighting. And then, you know, in the, if in a greenhouse, you know, you're constantly running a pump too. So energy wise, it also seems to take more energy too, because you're constantly running pumps through that or, and lighting as well. Um, and then I guess the other side, so I, I think it's definitely potential that we'd look into doing that, but then, you know, with hydroponics, you're also always having to bring in um, nutrients that are not really local sources. And so with soil, we can actually use local like seaweed, fish waste, our own compost that we're making. And so those kind of the local stuff rather than having to ship in nutrients for the plants. But um, but I have worked with hydroponics. And so I, I think it would be a good option to look at, especially for a bigger greenhouse that's that we want really high production rates on. But we yeah. don't also have, don't have data like the cost trade-offs okay. too of like shipping up the nutrients you know we don't have that research that's re and data that's really been collected for this area at least so mm -hmm. that's a good point because you know you are on the road system right and hooper bay's way or you're at least closer to her more accessible you have uh, big old ferries and stuff like that you know we're way, way on the west coast and that's the biggest thing that you know, um, is our problem is the cost of shipping. You know, we if you look up Hooper Bay, we're right at the west coast, right in the middle. And you know, uh, Bethel is a hundred, and the closest hub is Bethel, and you know it's so expensive. So that's another good point. You know, uh, that's why I asked if they're prefabbed or if we could, um, you know, uh, make our own designs and. Do that you know I, and uh, I want to bring up Myers farm it's really doable you know they do have a Myers farm in Bethel you know it's uh their their uh tundra is just like ours you know at one time when the missionaries first came to Hooper Bay there they were growing their own vegetables you know and it's very doable and that's a good thing that you know you guys are looking into it that's something that we actually were uh, looking into also that's why I wanted to ask these questions thank you and the uh, next questions, I hope I'm not taking too long with these questions, but uh, it's regarding the Daimi tribe. Um, you know, um, as you all know, that the uh, lower part of the Bering Sea, the crabbing fisheries have been closed and they haven't been doing really good. And, you know, that's uh, some things that, you know, I wonder if um, the Daimi tribe is looking into if they have data before this all started you know like water quality data and phytoplankton if there's there was a rise or fall you know um and one of the other questions was that was there any crab shell density change and you proved that you know and the reason i'm bringing up water quality is you know we are on the bering sea but we have our hooper bay and the tributaries are connected to the Yukon, although, and it connects right by Pilot Station. You know, we do fish Pilot Station. in that, in our bay, Hazen Bay, it's also connected to Pasunak. So, you know, that's another thing that our tribe want to look into is, you know, our water tributaries for, from for Hooper Bay and Hazen Bay being contaminated because we're connected to the Yukon. Mm. You know, that's something that we're um, 
actually start to think, you know, and we want to go ahead and try to pursue, you know, water data collection and all that kind of stuff. Cause you know, we still fish, we, we travel up the Kasunak river and we, you know, set nets there and it only flows one way and it's from the Yukon all the way out to our bay, all the way out to Hazen Bay. So that's one thing that, you know, we, uh, we live on a, we live on the Bering Sea. We still live off the tundra and we fish in our waters. So, you know, even if we live so far away from here and there, we're still affected by everything that's going on around us. So that's um, one thing that, you know, water quality testing, I know we used to do in the past, but it hasn't been done. That's been brought up. So, you know, I'm glad that, you know, these are happening, you know, these kinds of Zoom meetings. So, you know, like I all say, we're all from Alaska, but we're all unique, unique in our own way in our communities. You know, what works there might not work here or there. But these are really good ideas, you know, because we all are looking for the same thing is, you know, to better our community and tribal members. So thank you for um, um, listening to my questions and you know that's uh just something i wanted to say thanks thanks to all what what was your question for me though Sorry. yeah Sorry. um the water quality data are are oh. you you know with the crabbing that you are um uh doing collecting data on are you working closely or looking into data that was collected before the crab crabbing fisheries crash in the lower bering sea Nope. My my focus is strictly in our waters of the Bering Strait. Mm -hmm. My my focus is here, here on Diamede, not know any anywhere mm -hmm. else. I mean you're if you um Tess, can you go all the way back to the second slide where it shows a map? I, I don't know where he's where he's where his body of water is to the second one, second slide way up there. There's a map of Alaska. We're right on the west coast. Okay, you see, this is where I'm at. Second. Yeah, I know her little diamonds. Yep. Okay. Yep. So right there, and mm -hmm. then you you said you're where? Where are you? Right. Left. 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 If you see, oh. um, lower from you, but little to the right. Lower. 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 Way down there. Lower, lower, left, lower, left, there. That's where you're from. See, yeah, that's the different big. body of water. If you think about mm -hmm. it, so you're the, <laughs> there are different. But the I thing mean, is, you know, um, I know that uh, it's. I'm pretty sure it shows that the water's warming up. And uh, I, okay. I was just thinking, yep. you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. So well, you're different. There any uh, you're a different in... body of water. You know, and my mm -hmm. our our body of water is up there. This is what I'm focusing on, and this is the crab in our area that I'm I'm also focusing on as well. Because yep. mm -hmm. so, we notice, and, and we're and noticing we're not, changes in our bearing not, cells. We so. are not we are not commercial fishermen. Mm -hmm. Nope we 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 only do it subsistence. Mm -hmm. And that's the. The reason I'm asking is, you know, we notice our waters are warming up too, and you know, it's just some that you know. I thought there might be some data to help you with your collection and prevention, because you know, we we all live on the sea, Bering Sea. You know, we see changes, and uh, like in a few years ago, we we saw a lot of seabirds, puffins, and other seabirds washing up on our shore, dead. And um, in 2019, I believe it was 2019 or 2018, we had, I think, total of four humpback whales washed up on our 14 miles of shore. So that was another big problem. So, you know, that's the thing. I'm, that's the reason I'm asking these questions. You know, it, is it coming up and up and up the Bering Sea? Because the water flows from the south all the way up. And you know, with the um, also the cruise ships, you know, uh, that's a big problem with in our minds. You know, that'll that'll be a 
big problem in the future. You know, they, they're allowed to dump waste so far out in the shore, off the shore, I believe it's four miles. And that's, you know, when we're out in the seal hunting in the springtime, we go at about 17, 20, 30 miles offshore. You know, we have seabirds, we have fish and all that. So that's the, that's why we're trying to look into water quality also to see what's now. And we're trying to see data from other places. That's the reason why I want to, you know, come up and you know, ask about this uh, data from other other places. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, Jen, for all of those thoughts. Um, I just wanted to give like some time. We are running 15 minutes over and into your lunch break. So I don't want to spend too much time knowing that you all are busy individuals, but I did see that Kenneth had his hand raised or um, was your question? I just, I just wanted to add that uh, we do transboundary river testing here and we have five major transboundary rivers here. We're lucky we have a whole bunch of rivers and the boundaries right here. So the boundaries always been on the top of the mind. You just, Jan, you just reminded me beautifully that it's not the boundary, it's the river. And the Yukon is transboundary all the way out to your place. So you should be able to get transboundary water testing. And I, I believe it's EPA that's, uh, I got maybe. Uh, so you guys are being affected by transboundary river situations being on the Yukon. Pursue mm -hmm. that. Do exactly what they're, we're doing that here. We have five major rivers here. We're, we're lucky in Klinkerani. We have a lot. But the, the, you reminded me all the way out there at the end, all the way out there at your place, that's still transboundary. So mm -hmm. pursue specifically transboundary watershed yeah, or transboundary water river watershed. water quality okay. testing. That's okay, all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Kenneth. Well, thank you to our presenters. Um, it's so good to hear about all the work happening in Alaska. And um, yeah, we will end this meeting um, and let you all go to lunch. Thank you, Tess. Y'all take care. Good to see new faces and good to see the ones I've met before and hear the ones I've met before. Y'all take care.